I cannot juggle. Do you see the struggle? Nido Reno versus Gengar, the decades long duel that has since been in the intro to many games and the anime. In fact, it's possibly the first Pokemon battle so many people ever saw. Do you remember the first Pokemon battle you saw? I do. And it was not this one. For me, it was that stupid, dumb, hilarious Metapod versus Metapod battle. On like what? Episode four? Actually, I'm gonna look that up now, hang on. I was right. Nice. Good guess, I guess. I swear I didn't just know that. I'm not some Pokemon trivia expert or anything. <laughs> Could you imagine? Now, also imagine that being your introduction to Pokemon. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know what people need in this day and age? Careers. And the well-paying field of data analysis and data management are still growing rapidly. And today's sponsor, DataCamp, wants to teach you all of the ins and the outs so that you can excel in the field. Get your foot in the door! DataCamp is an online learning cornucopia of helpful data skills that anyone can learn, with hundreds of topics ranging from the most basic level of Excel spreadsheet organization all the way to SQL database building. Coding savvy or not, they have you covered. Not everyone's a robot, and neither am I, and DataCamp makes it easy for us squish brains to learn at our own pace. Having some of the best instructors out there and being entirely browser-based with no software required, you can learn right from your own home, just like everything else we do these days. Take entire courses, practice what you've learned, apply that knowledge in projects inspired by real-world problems, and get assessed. I love how the majority of these projects are like real important things involving data analysis, and then there's what makes a Pokemon legendary? Real-world applications, but hey, that's perfect for me. That's a, that's a very a real-world application for me. But actually, a lot of these are fun, and having fun learning means you're more likely to actually remember what you've learned. That's why they're fun. Plus, if you use my link below, you will get the first chapter of any course free. Subscriptions start at $25 a month, but you don't need a credit card to apply, so there's nothing to lose in trying it out. Personally, I recommend Python, but that's just because it's the only one I know. So really, why Nidorino? And why Gengar? Why not Charizard or Pikachu? Heck, even Clefairy makes more sense. Clefairy was going to be the original mascot, after all, before Pikachu dethroned it. I have a whole video about that debacle here. But actually, if you had Pokemon Blue as opposed to Pokemon Red or Green, this introductory battle for you was different. Pokemon Blue version has Gengar versus Jigglypuff. Well, the Nidorino sprite certainly looks a lot cooler, which I guess is why all future references to this Gen 1 showdown thing would go on to show Nidorino. And this fight has been referenced a lot. In fact, it's the first fight of the anime. During the League Cup, the opening scene is Gengar versus Nidorino, while Ash is watching it through the TV. Nidorino gets bodied by Gengar, and Bruno pulls out his Onyx instead. And also, heck, even the opening of Pokemon Origins has this fight fading from the game to the real animation. It's chilling how this small Easter egg really strikes a nostalgia chord. It's also referenced in Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee, being the poster next to the computer. The starting battle, the first fight, the opener, the all-important entrance to the world of Pokemon fighting. So then why is it Gengar and Nidorino? I mean, from a competitive standpoint, it doesn't make much sense. I mean, a Nidorino? Why would you have a Nidorino versus a Gengar? Swap that out right now, man. It's no use. Maybe if you evolved it into Nido King, it'd be good. It'd have the ground type advantage over Gengar's poison. But as it stands, just look at the moves that they naturally learn in Gen 1. Not only is that pathetic, but it's also bad. Gengar is straight up immune to all but one of Nidorino's naturally known moves. And that one that it can hit it with is Poison Sting, which not only is a super weak and useless move, but Gengar still resists it. Meanwhile, Gengar naturally knows Dream Eater, which is super effective against Nidorino. <laughs> who? Nidorino? Who are you? 
Okay, well maybe the neat arena that it shows knows some TM moves. What TM moves can it learn in Gen 1? Oh, nothing useful. Nothing super effective against Gengar anyway. Great. And what is Nidorino even doing in the first fight? It fades to white just before the attack hits, as if this were some big dramatic scene. But like, what is this? Tackle? Horn drill? Horn drill is pretty dramatic when it lands. It's too bad though that Gengar is immune to that. <laughs> it's not like this fight is emblematic of what Pokemon is all about, right? I mean, maybe? Type advantages are the bread and butter of Pokemon battling, and this is an incredibly one-sided fight. But the way the animation plays out makes it seem like it's giving the win to Nidorino. Which is dumb. So like, there's gotta be a canonic reason, right? What's the lore here? Well, here's the story you never knew. Pokemon Masters may give us a glimpse at what's going on here. While Pokemon Masters in and of itself isn't canon to the mainline games, because it can't be, because time passes throughout and between the mainline Pokemon games, but Pokemon Masters, all of the characters are the ages that they were in the main games as if their times are independent. It doesn't work. But despite that, games like this do give us more details on who the characters are as characters. Think of those huge crossover fighting games. Of course Phoenix Wright fighting and meeting Spider-Man isn't canon, but their interactions are true to their characters. What would these characters do if they were put in this situation based on their past doings? Also, any skills or flashback scenes or mentions of the past in these big crossover -y games could still be seen as canon to their character development. We may not have known how good Marth is at counting if not for that one scene in Smash Bros, for instance. We'll each need to take down about 10. How did he count that fast? And this idea is what we're doing here, specifically with Agatha in Pokemon Masters. Why Agatha? Well, because her main Pokemon, her partner Pokemon, is Gengar. In fact, if the anime is anything to go off of, the Gengar in this battle is very likely her Gengar, as the intro battle shows a Pokemon League battle between the iconic duo. And Nidorino's trainer is a silhouette, but clearly is Bruno, who, along with Agatha, make up half of the Kanto Elite Four members. But is this an alright assumption to make? Well, maybe. Let's look at the rest of the picture. Like, first of all, why the heck does Bruno have a Nidorino? Bruno never has a Nidorino outside of this scene. Not in the anime, not in the games, or even in the manga series. But looking at the build and outfit and the hair, this silhouette very clearly is Bruno. And the Pokemon he throws out next is Onix, a Pokemon Bruno is so fond of, he has two of them in the games. Well, keep that info in the back of your mind. The first instance of this iconic clash is of course at the start of Pokemon Red and Green, just before the title screen. But then just after the title screen, there's another important bit. The part where a terrifying looking sprite of Professor Oak welcomes you to the world of Pokemon. And what Pokemon does he have to show you? A neat Reno. Considering this comes right after the scene you just watched, is the connection here intended? Does the Nidorino that we saw in the intro belong to Professor Oak? And if so, then why is the Professor battling a Gengar that supposedly belongs to Agatha? Does Professor Oak have anything to do with Agatha? Do you have to ask? Two out of Agatha's three lines in the original games relate to Professor Oak. Oak's taken a lot of interest in you, child. That old Duff was once tough and handsome. That was decades ago. Now he just wants to fiddle with his Pokédex. He's wrong. Pokémon are for fighting. And... You win. I see what the old Duff sees in you now. This implies that they once had a relationship together. She thought he was handsome, and that now he's a shadow of his former self. And for the longest time, this was all we had to go off of. But then, in Pokémon Masters, we learn more about their shared history together. She even says he was charming. But then that Duff Oak would not stop talking to me. I think he was just trying to be nice, but he was giving me advice I never asked for. Sounds like Professor Oak, being an enthusiastic professor, was just trying to flirt. 
in his own way. And she didn't like it. She wanted to be deep in contemplation, as spirit mediums often do, but he just kept talking. I thought I'd shut him up with a Pokemon battle. And that right there already implies Agatha's Gengar versus Professor Oak's Nidorino. But there's more. But back then, that old guy was strong. Undefeated, in fact. Was he as good as me? He was better. So I battled Oak again and again. At some point, the time I spent with him started meaning a lot to me, further implying a relationship of sorts. But then she gets sad and says, all of a sudden, Oak wants to make a Pokedex. I told him Pokemon are for battling, but he wouldn't listen. He wasted my precious time, and when he's had enough of our battles, he left. He left. Ugh, why do charming men have to be so meddlesome? It very clearly implies a relationship gone awry. And who knows how long that lasted, but clearly while it was happening they had numerous Pokemon battles. Battles that were Nidorino versus Gengar, the one Pokemon Oak is shown having in the original games, and Agatha's main Pokemon that she actually has two of. She could have three if she evolved her Haunter. But Pokemon Masters came out so long after Red and Green, so was this really the intent Game Freak had all the way back then? Well, maybe. Agatha and Oak are the only two really old and wrinkly main characters aside from maybe Blaine, but Agatha specifically mentions Oak when spoken to. And they have the right Pokemon for it. Plus, Oak always coming out on top would also explain the intro animation in the game that sort of implies that Nidorino is finishing the battle with this attack. Despite being at a huge disadvantage, Professor Oak was still able to defeat Agatha and actually used his skill to become the first Triennial Indigo League champion in the Pokemon Adventures manga, where a rivalry with Agatha is also mentioned. And also, in the games, there is a cut endgame battle with Professor Oak where his Pokemon are all leveled higher than the champion's Pokemon, further implying this all to be the case. And then, way after we originally finished this script, we often write months ahead of time, Pokemon Masters added Professor Oak. And not only does he use Nidorino, but wouldn't you know it, they even reference the iconic scene. Jeez. So there is definitely an argument to be made that this iconic scene is perhaps the finishing blow to Gengar that led to Professor Oak becoming the first Pokemon League champion, since becoming the champion is the whole goal of the first game. And after he does that, he retires his Pokemon training to focus on Pokedex development. But if that's the case for the games, why isn't that what the anime shows? Nidorino belongs to Bruno. Well, the anime wanted to open the same way the games did, with Gengar versus Nipple Reno. But they couldn't just have Nidorino belonging to Oak, because Oak was currently on TV talking about a starter Pokemon program. He's currently busy giving away Charmanders and Squirtles and wondering what to do with all the Bulbasaurs. He can't be in two places at once, so they just gave Nidorino to Bruno for some reason even though he never has one before and never has one ever again. But then, why show Bruno here at all? Well, there is that classic theory that Bruno is Ash's dad, which this scene sort of sets up, but that is just another theory. So I guess that's sort of an answer as to why these two are the iconic first two, and that's a supposed lore reason, at least, but why choose these two from a designer's standpoint? Why did Game Freak sit down and decide that these would be the two Pokemon that would introduce everyone to Pokemon? I mean, without even thinking about it, the two that would make the most sense would be Charizard and Venusaur, the two Pokemon that are on the first two game boxes. Well, it could be because these two Pokemon are a perfect example of what Pokemon are. If you've never seen a Pokemon before, and your first real example are these two Pokemon fighting, you get two extremely different examples of pocket monsters. Nidorino is a rabbit kaiju monster thing based loosely on real world animals that's down on all fours, while Gengar is an upright standing dark shadow with very little detail, a ghost, fantastical by default. Also, Gengar is fully evolved while Nidorino is not. All of this expresses the differences in Pokemon right away, saying, hey, Pokemon are crazy magic, but some are normal and kinda lifelike. Well, as normal and lifelike as a rabbit monster can be, but then again, there is just straight up a seal 
in Gen 1, but with a horn. Also, both of these designs are very, like, boy-focused. Like, boys would love these because they're so cool-looking. They could have been more drastic and had, like, Gengar versus Vileplume because it's a flower. But they wanted to stick with one particular kind of target audience, maybe. I've heard people claim that these were the first two Pokémon designed, and that's why they were honored as the first two Pokémon you see. But that's wrong. It was Rhydon, who's also a cutie little kaiju dude. However, they both have very clearly been made early in the designing process, and that could have been factored into why they chose them as the first fight. And that idea is backed up by the fact that they were both in the original concept manga, Capsule Monsters, which is basically the prototype to Pokémon. So Game Freak could have been honoring these OG designs with being the first Pokémon the player ever sees. And I think that's a pretty solid hypothesis, especially when you add in that juicy detail that Gengar is actually Ken Sugimori's favorite Pokémon, as confirmed in an interview. He loves its simplistic design. But what do you think? Why Gengar and Nidorino? And do you think Agatha vs. Oak was the original intent, or was that added on after the fact? Let me know below, and until next time, never stop using your noggin. Thank <laughs> you.